podcast. Igniting both the art and the science of functional medicine. Here's your host, Dr. Brad Watts. Welcome, Nutrition Hero family, to the next episode of the Nutrition Hero podcast. This is Dr. Brad Watts, and I have a guest with me today, none other than our buddy from a past episode way back, Dr. Ruben Valdez. Dr. Valdez, welcome, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Brad. Yeah. Absolutely in love with Nutrition Hero. Ah, thank you. So, how you been? Pretty great, man. Pretty great. Living some exciting times right now in the world of functional medicine. That's, That's true. For sure. All right. Well, I'm going to ask you all about it. Uh, if you are listening to this right now going, who is this handsome gentleman on the other side of the camera? Um, Dr. Ruben Valdez has been a guest on the podcast before, and we got to talk about functional medicine, its birth, and some of the, the art behind it, and some of the stuff that drives you as a doctor. And we're back today because one of the things I wanted to do is check in with you. Once you had uh, this very exciting new frontier under control, under your thumb, and I want to talk about that today, and that is the world of cognitive decline. Well, Brad, um, as we spoke about originally a few months ago when you had had me on the show previously, you heard me speak about um, putting together a program for doctors that were wanting to move into the field of cognitive decline. I myself had uh, been researching and working in the field of cognitive decline now for roughly three and a half years. And there's been, you know, it's been so interesting, so exciting, uh, putting this all together and ultimately turning it into something that that I've been able to move forward to, to a lot of doctors around the country. Now, the important thing about that, and I think the thing that most people won't understand when they hear about this, is that for the longest time, cognitive decline and early Alzheimer's disease have been the one disease that as doctors, from any background, any training, it has been kind of the untouchable disease. 100% fatality, nobody knows an Alzheimer's survivor, even though we know cancer survivors and mm -hmm. diabetes survivors and autoimmune survivors, this has been for the longest time the untouchable disease. And many of us have had family members, loved ones, friends, uh, relatives, neighbors that have succumbed to this devastating illness. In the world of cognitive decline since 1984, there has been a massive pursuit to try and find a solution, a cure, a medication, just anything and everything that would shine a little bit of light and hope to the people who are succumbing to this devastating disease. And as you and I both know, um, all the way up to 2014, there has been zero hope, zero direction, zero promise for the patients that have suffered from cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease. When did that research start, though? Like the traditional model, when, when was it on the horizon? And they were like, hey, this is a problem. Let's try to develop something to fix this. Well, um, the first time the disease process was first described was at the turn of the century, early 1900s. And back at that time, it was actually a very, very rare disease. Huh. It, was, it was rarely reported in the literature. It, it was believed to be a rare occurrence. And as a matter of fact, it should actually be a very, very rare disease. It's actually really hard for somebody to develop full-blown Alzheimer's disease. And so it kind of stayed in the back of, of the annals of medicine. It really didn't um, catch fire until all of a sudden, um, early in the early 2000s, we started getting word uh -huh. that this disease was kind of exploding. And it is currently on track to move from the sixth leading cause of death all the way up to the third leading cause of death in the next 10 years here in the United States. So all of a sudden, now it's a humongous problem. Um, a lot of the researchers are, uh, across the country had been bumping their head for a really long time, looking for this monomechanistic approach, this pharmacological agent that could affect change in the brain to either at least stop the progression of the disease process and even even better potentially heal it or cure it but most of them kept coming back empty-handed every single mm -hmm. time one of these researchers and maybe this answers your question but uh dr bredesen and his group 
um, out of the Buck Institute for Alzheimer's Research had been researching Alzheimer's and cognitive impairment for the best part of 27, 28 years, coming back empty handed every single time under the drug therapy approach mm -hmm. until what you and I both know was a very remarkable discovery and publication that happened in 2014. So before that publication came out, is there any progress or has there been any change? Has there been any drug, any diet, any lifestyle modification, anything that they have found, they meaning the medical researchers have found that put a dent in the disease process? Zero, zero bad, not, not even as close as a scratch. Um, wow. Unfortunately, uh, there have been many medications in the pipeline. There's primarily six approved medications for cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease, Aricep, Namenda, Memantine, Exelon. These, these medications are approved, but if you ask anybody in the field, they will be very honest to tell you they don't make a scratch on the disease process for many reasons. One of them is they, ba they work basically on enzymes that break down neurotransmitters in the brain. Mm -hmm. And Alzheimer's disease and cognitive impairment is not a disease of neurotransmitters. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we're going to get a little bit into the mechanism and the pathophysiology yeah. of the disease process. But you're treating completely the wrong thing. And even worse, when these patients go on these medications, not only don't, do they not really see any remarkable or remarkable improvements, once they're on them, they can't go off of them for the rest of their lives because now they've built up excess enzymes mm -hmm. as a response to the medication throughout their lifetime. And if you remove it, they break down most of their neurotransmitters and they decline very, very rapidly. So when you're going through medical school, which you did, what in the world, like, are you talking about this stuff or is this um, like, yeah, we're not going to talk about Alzheimer's disease. Is this actually a topic of conversation? It, it is. I mean, it does come forward. And sadly, you hear the same repeated theory over and over again. Um, mm -hmm. Alzheimer's disease is a consequence of amyloid placking and amyloid buildup in the brain, which we now know, and it's been proven time and time again, it is a false, um, it is a, it's a, it's a rabbit trail that leads nowhere because it's simply not the true mechanism of the disease. And it's, um, you know, these tau fragments and this neurofibrillary tangles are responsible for this neurodegenerative process. And we now know that nothing could be further from the truth. Gotcha. So interesting, but like in a really almost sadistic kind of way, a um, hundred and fourteen years, we'll just give it the, the turn of the century. We'll just say then, but a hundred and fourteen years where the disease is basically untouched, undented, not even from an inf like information perspective. Uh, that's, that's, um, I mean, I don't even know the words to describe it because it's just as frustrating more than anything I would imagine. Um, but there's light, obviously 2014. Let's talk about that. What, um, what have you been seeing since 2014? That's about the time you got involved in all this stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Right after the first publication, um, it came out in aging September, 2014, and it was a paper by Bredesen and his group, uh, mm -hmm. called reversal of cognitive decline in that study. They had a uh, reverse. They demonstrated reversal in nine out of 10 patients. They're now called the first 10. Mm -hmm. Many of them already within the spectrum of Alzheimer's disease. These patients uh, showed both subjective improvements, meaning their symptoms resolved. They were able to start remembering. They were able to go back to work. They started uh, functioning at a very high level. They became independent again and, in addition to that, they started also showing objective improvements. So all of the cognitive evaluations could no longer detect or diagnose cognitive impairment in these patients. As uh, the protocol has been refined, now we can also see objective changes in imaging in the brain confirming that the reversal happens not only at the subjective symptom level, but there's also significant improvement in the brain anatomy itself. So let's give the listeners a little bit of um, piece by piece. What is the protocol? What does a typical successful treatment model even look like, number one? And then number two, like how can they learn this? Where are they going to find this information? 
Yeah. So I, I guess there's a lot to that question. Uh, the first yes. piece is uh, the protocol has been uh, continuing to be improved and polished. So from that rough beginning with the first 10 patients, right now it is estimated that about 2,200 patients have gone through the protocol uh, nationally with over a 92% success rate. Wow. So this is not only making a dent, this is opening a big, big door um, towards hope in the field of Alzheimer's disease and cognitive impairment. Hmm. Now, my journey has been a really um, interesting journey. Um, for one, as functional medicine doctors, we have all the tools that we need. You might be out there wondering, like, who is going to take care of these people? These <laughs> cases sound supremely complex, supremely difficult, just, you know, but you can't even touch it with a 10 foot pole. Well, if you're wondering who is the best person to take care of these patients and you're listening to this podcast, you are, that's right. You are. <laughs> that's right. You it's are. you, man. It's, it's you, you are trained. You have all the foundations that you need in functional medicine mm. to be able to actually identify these patterns and help these patients. The only additions, and we'll talk a little bit about those are minimal additions that are bolted onto this protocol um, in comparison to treating, you know, diabetes or autoimmune mm -hmm. or, or all these other things that we're so used to. Now, in my journey, I went through, through the IFM uh, the first time that they made this course available mm -hmm. to doctors nationwide. They, I submitted an application and they took on 200 doctors. So I was part, I was part of that first group. And it was like this, all of this awesome clinical information, most of it, we had already been really skilled and trained at doing because it was basically functional medicine, right? Um, and the few pieces that that were new to the protocol, I was pretty quick to be able to understand it and, and bring it into application. But now, the challenge, the real challenge of the protocol came in putting all of these pieces and turning it into something that I could, first of all, uh, create understanding in the patient, put it into bite-sized pieces, and ultimately help them transition into care. So let's talk about some of those pieces. I know that you talk about holes in a roof. I know that you talk about the different types of testing that are, is available. There's some yeah. that a lot of the listeners are going to know about and some that they might not know about yet. Um, yeah. The different threats and the pillars. Let's, let's get into the nitty gritty stuff here. Let's figure Absolutely. out. Let's um, nerd out. Yeah, like let's, let's at least put a name to some of these things so that we know what the, the pieces are to the game here. Yeah. Absolutely. So the first thing is that Alzheimer's is actually not a true disease, um, even though we perceive it as one. Alzheimer's is really a combination of multiple little diseases or dysfunctions that ultimately amount up to this ultimate change in the brain, this downsizing in the brain. So when we talk about the roof with 36 holes, what we're talking is about um, a, co a complex disease process that has all of these little mechanisms that are happening at the same time. As you might expect, if you take a medication and you plug one of those holes in, in the hope that water's not going to come into the structure, you're absolutely flawed. That's why these patients keep getting worse and worse because there's a lot of stuff up there that's not being addressed. Now, as far as those mechanisms, they've been broken down into six primary mechanisms or six primary drivers. You have your type ones, which is inflammation. This is functional medicine 101, right. your CRP, your homocysteines, your interleukins, your leaky guts, you know, the addition to that is the APOE4 status, the gene. And if, if it's there, you treat it like you treat inflammation anyways. You utilize some of the foundational pillars of the program to address it. You have your type twos, which are your trophic deficiencies. The brain needs a lot of different things to be able to work optimally. It needs, you know, hormones. It needs nutrients. It needs certain minerals. It needs to have certain things in proper balance. And so when you look at those and you find where those deficiencies are, you correct them and you support them. You have your type 1.5s, which are your glycotoxic. These are commonly going to be your type 2 diabetics, your long-standing mm -hmm. diabetics. They have a pretty lethal combination. On one side, they have their insulin resistance, which is a trophic deficiency. And 
their high blood sugar, which is inflammatory in nature. And so that combination is a big threat to the brain. You've probably heard of the, ter of the term uh, type 3 diabetes. It's exactly the same as type 1.5 Alzheimer's. Hmm. Then we have kind of like the rare uh, variants one of the ones that we're learning more and more about every day is the subtype three, which is the toxic illness divided into two subtypes, heavy metal toxicity or biotoxin toxicity, which can be your molds and your limes and your, you know, infections that can be biotoxin producing. That's kind of the new piece, one of the new bolt-ons to this program. And it's actually pretty easy and pretty turnkey to be able to learn it if you have, you know, if you've gone through it and you can right. be effective at communicating that knowledge. And so you have your type fours, which are your vasculars, small vessel disease of the brain, history of TIAs. These things can actually change perfusion into the brain, creating decline. And ultimately you have your subtype five, which are your traumatic people that have had traumatic brain injuries or repetitive head trauma throughout their lives are uniquely predisposed to experiencing amnestic and non-amnestic cognitive impairment throughout their lifetime. That is um, the approach to break it down into the simplest form like that. You got to appreciate the process that that allows the practitioner to go through as far as organization. I like how organized all this stuff is. It's not a bunch of wheeling and dealing. Um, and I just, I feel like that helps not only the practitioner, but the patient be able to latch onto this thing. Cause that's really the cool part is the patient. So you went through uh, Bredesen's training with the IFM. What type of challenges did you come up against when you're trying to implement a strategy with the patient? Because the patient is what matters in all of this. Well, let me, let me kind of create some context so you can understand what I encountered. Um, on one side, you're dealing with individuals that are living within the spectrum of cognitive impairment. That means that to a lesser or greater extent, they're not firing on all cylinders. Right. So, so it's not like when you deal with your type two diabetic or your thyroid patient where you can uh, give out a lot and they can handle a lot um, right away. For a lot of these patients, there were a lot of things that needed to be broken down, fine tuned, polished, developed, uh, the way that we involve the family for support in the cases that were a little bit more progressed, the verbiage that we use to be able to help them understand the steps and the unique steps that they were going to take. Another major challenge is the fact that uh, they see their brains declining. And so they're very, uh, they're very um, um, motivated to take on a lot of things. And I just want to get it all done and right. guide them through a method where you can start breaking this down and allowing them to master each one of the pieces huh. of the protocol. So it becomes nice and clean, nice and effective. And they actually become high, highly successful at putting in these tools into their day-to-day -day lives. Um, in addition to that, I ran into a lot of difficulties making the diagnosis real for them. And here's what I mean by that. Um, I was using subjective testing. I was using blood testing. I was using all of these things to try and help uh, create context for them in understanding if they had a problem, how bad the problem was, and what were the potential reasons why they were having this problem. So it took a lot of trial and error, a lot of hitting myself against the floor and against the wall, a lot of learning going back to the drawing board to ultimately be able to create a process that is seamless for them to be able to be evaluated, obtain a very, very accurate diagnosis, be able to really make the connection of what's going on with their brains, where are they and where they need to start moving um, to be able to avoid the fate that they're headed towards. Um, in addition to that, there were a lot of other challenges amongst them. How do I market this? What kind of verbiage do I use? What kind right. of ad? What kind of information? What is correct? What's legal? What's, what, what, what should I steer away from? Um, you know, what should this pro program cost? What is the overall cost of taking somebody through this process? What tools overall am I going to need? You know, all of the administrative procedures, how to train my staff so they could help these patients step by step. Um, as you can imagine, it's been a monumental 
a monumental <laughs> amount of work, trial and error, learning to yeah. ultimately create a process that is literally seamless from A to Z, from a patient that is worried and concerned. Do I have a problem? Is mm -hmm. this, am I going to see dementia in my lifetime? From that point, all the way up to the phone call, to the, to the conversion, to the acceptance into care, all the way into their outcomes, their testimonial, um, everything in that process has been now perfectly and seamlessly worked out. And um, as you might imagine, it's been no small feat, but it has been more than worth it. And, and if you want, I mean, I'd be really happy to talk about the amount of impact that we're having here in the Denver community, uh, the results that we're seeing, the amazing impact that it's having on our practice. It's just been a remarkable experience. So, so, so let's go there then. From a general perspective, what are you finding as far as patient results within the clinical model itself? Yeah, so as far as the clinical model, what we're seeing with the majority of our patients, it takes between four to six months for them to actually start turning the curve. And it is which means what? Which means um, starting to see the disease actually reverse. Hmm. It means for them to start remembering. And it's really interesting because it's almost always the family members and the people around them that start commenting. They're like, oh my God, you're starting to remember. We haven't had to repeat the same thing like seven times to you today. Yeah. So they start uh, noticing that they're remembering more and more. They become more independent. They don't have to be as obsessive note takers and calendar keepers because now they're remembering and sequencing the event of their days little by little. I've had so many patients that have been able to kind of pick up their lives, start paying their bills again, um, not need the help and guidance and support and direction 24 seven from their families to be able to just live their lives. Patients that are going back to work Patients that have lost privileges like driving, having gained those privileges once again, and ultimately hey, that's cool. becoming themselves once yeah. again. Yeah. All right. That's cool. So because we're the Nutrition Hero Podcast, let's get into a specific case. Um, and you can change their name for security purposes or whatever, right? But the point is, is let's get into a specific case and kind of paint out um, the patient's story and with a name and like the details as to what was going on, um, just so we can like make this real here. Absolutely. So that's, that's kind of cool. I have one case that I'm really, really excited about. He is a physician here in Denver. Very, very recognized. He's had buildings um, erected after him. Uh, um, and he came in in pretty bad shape. He came in with his wife. Uh, he went to one of my talks and at the end of the talk, he, you know how we usually kind of walk out of there because if not, we get three kachillion questions. So on my way out, he grabs my hand and he told me, I really, really need you. I really need you. Please uh, take me on, help me out. I'm so-and-so, this is my card. So he came into the practice and obviously, you know, I evaluated him. We looked at the neuroquant. He had pretty extensive downsizing in the brain. So his imaging was showing that the disease process was active. He was losing matter from his hippocampus from portions of his cortex. So this guy undoubtedly was on his way to Alzheimer's and he was going to see full blown Alzheimer's in his lifetime. And so after testing him, I found some pretty basic things. He had a TSH of like 8.7. His thyroid was all messed up. All of his inflammatory markers were high. His kidneys were actually slowing down. So he had high creatinine, high urea. He mm -hmm. had issues with his uric acid. So it was kind of like inflammation on top of inflammation on top of inflammation. Um, he had mild vascular changes in the brain. He had had history of a couple of head tra traumas here, here and there. He actually tested negative for the APOE, the dreaded Alzheimer's mm -hmm. gene. He didn't have any heavy metal toxicity. He didn't have any biotoxic um, uh, exposures. So it was a really simple case. In the beginning, it was crazy. This guy would forget appointments. He would show up on days where he had no appointments. It was terrible. And so we would call him. Sometimes he wouldn't know who was calling him. So one of the things I, I did early on 
his wife is a ski instructor. So I told him, you got to come down from, from Aspen for at least two months to help him out because he's not really in good shape. So she helped him out. We put the five pillars into play, which we can talk about. And then we customized care to address these little things that we were finding. Long and behold, four, four weeks after his wife came and started supporting him, he started uh, turning the curve. He started keeping all of his appointments. He came in one day. He told me, dude, I'm starting to write my book again. I'm so excited. I'm starting to remember. And so the main challenge for him has been that uh, he really likes ice cream. And so we did find a little bit of insulin resistance. And so every once in a while, he would go out, sneak a little bit of ice cream. And the next day, he would kind of be all over the place. And so until his wife finally figured out that this guy was sneaking out and getting ice cream. And so we found a company out on the East Coast that makes keto ice cream. They're called sure. Wink. Have you seen them? Yeah. And so we found this treat for him in the moment that he actually really liked it. Apparently they're delicious. And the moment that we were able to get him on all kind of checking out all the boxes, he has continued to improve and improve and improve, which has been really remarkable because he has now started me introducing me to all his physician friends. And he's like, this is the guy that's working this miracle, uh, which has been really quite a fantastic experience. That's fun, man. That's really fun. So yeah, you it's mentioned fun. the five pillars, uh, briefly, what are your five pillars that you're, you're talking about here? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, for every patient, there's going to be five foundations and on those foundations is what we use to then customize care. But really simply, uh, for most patients, they're going to go on a keto diet. Um, we call it Keto Flex 12.3, so it's mostly plant-based fats. We use animal protein kind of like a condiment. Uh, we do allow it, but not, you know, all the time. Right. Um, we also do intermittent fasting. Uh, we look very closely at their sleep. We want to make sure they're getting at least their seven to eight, their seven to eight hours. At night is when the brain clears away de uh, debris. It goes through autophagy. It builds pathways. So sleep is really, really important in this process. Uh, we also want to make sure that uh, they're exercising at least eight to 10 minutes a day. And that's HIT, high intensity interval training. So I have some really, really old patients. My oldest patient right now is 93. And I actually have his testimonial. So if your <laughs> audience uh, wants to see his, it's amazing. Sure. He's like, I'm 93 and my brain is as sharp as ever it's kind of cool um, yeah. but even this guy's like on his bike doing little intervals for about 10 minutes a day um, and then lastly we do some brain training there's some mm -hmm. some softwares out there that are really really good they're easy they're turnkey um, even a five-year-old can use them and mm -hmm. they train the different domains of the brain and of cognitive function I love it I love it so <laughs> you mentioned a little bit about the business side of it here and and um, I just want to make sure I got these notes right because I was asking questions earlier and you had mentioned that uh, for fees, a service, and all this kind of stuff, your initial treatment plan is upwards of $15,000 for a patient. How in the world are your patients responding to this stuff? Man, it is impressive, Brad. Um, I mean, that's basically what the treatment protocol costs. Mm -hmm. And I, I have rarely ever seen a single patient that has turned down care. These really? patients, yeah, it's super impressive. They come in. Um, it's actually very simple. Once I'm able to put everything in order for them, show mm -hmm. them the diagnosis, show them where they are. It's really simple for them to really understand what going on they understand that there's really no other options there's no one out there doing this work doing this work at this level um, and 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 I mean we should have hundreds if not thousands of doctors nationwide doing this work at this level but unfortunately there's nobody else out there and so when they come in they're super compelled they're super motivated they're amazing patients they're so grateful from day one mm. they're so appreciative i'm so happy that you're doing this work it, it's so impressive thank you so much the family's super grateful that you take their case um it's really like uh, i mean 
and it, I get emotional because it's really rewarding. There was a time where you and I, we went into school, we had all these hopes, dreams, and aspirations of helping people that were in need, people that, that really needed help, support, and hope in their lives, even more so when we became functional medicine uh, practitioners and we got into clinical nutrition. We did it because we wanted to help um, patients at the highest level that we could. And finally, in my career, I have found a path that has put me exactly in that very spot in that situation. And it's so fulfilling on every end, on, on the patient results side, on the family support side, on the community level. Uh, we feel very fortunate because we feel that we're being remunerated at the level and at the worth that we really have as doctors for the impact that we're having. And, and the change in our practice has been incredible, incredible. The energy, the enthusiasm from the staff, the love, the passion. We are on fire for saving a billion brains. A billion a billion. A billion. That With means a, you're going to have to expand outside the Denver area here, sir. So absolutely. a billion. That's, that is that's awesome. What we're working on. We're, we're definitely working on that. All right. So how many people in your area are doing this type of work right now? Is it just you guys for real or do you have, are there like competitors? There is nobody else. Nobody really? else, Brad. No one else in our area. We are experiencing um, being first to market right now. And basically, um, we are the go-to clinic. And what's even most impressive, patients and this this information is reaching critical mass. Like patients are searching for this stuff. They're Googling Dr. Bredesen's book, The End of Alzheimer's. It's out there. It's been a New York Times number one one bestseller for a really long time. People are trying to find who's doing this. Who can I go to that can do this for me? And it's amazing the moment that they see that you are a provider, that you are bringing this service to your community. I mean, not just because you know how to do it clinically, but you're having the impact, you're having the results, you're having the outcomes. It's a game changer for any practice. I like it. So you mentioned um, a couple minutes ago that you had, you're teaching other people this process and you talked about streamlining it. How many doctors do you have right now that you've been, you know, teaching this stuff? Yeah. So currently uh, we, I have 21 doctors that I've been teaching uh, mm -hmm. the entire system from the clinical to the administrative, to the admissions process, to the diagnostic process, the marketing um, the sequence of what happens in each visit, how do you move this patient effectively through care. And out of those 21 doctors, they're having exactly the same experience mm. that I'm having here in Denver. They are being first to market. They're gaining a lot of ground in their markets. They're having patients coming in kind of like just asking to be accepted as patients and to be taken into the protocol. And they're seeing massive success with their patients as far as the results that they're being able to provide. And in addition, their practices are becoming very, very healthy and mm. well-recognized practices in their communities. The aspect that you learned when you were um, in that class of 200 people that were the first to learn this, um, is that, so the process that you're teaching doctors right now is different than the one that you learned? The process yes. that you're teaching uh, doctors right now is more comprehensive or what's the, what are the differences between the two? Well, huge. Do you understand that that is um, only a clinical foundation and clinical foundation is important because you obtain a basic skill set, but um, your ability to provide that clinical service is only as good as the health of your business, of your practice. If you have a practice that is not set up for this as much as you want to, it's not going to go well. And a lot of the people that went through that class with me, I've been in contact with a lot of them. And I'm like, how many people are you helping? You know, isn't this amazing? You're not changing lives. Are you changing lives? And they're like, well, well you know, I saw one patient this month. I saw three patients this month. And so it's, it's really unfortunate. In addition to that, 
the, like I said, this is reaching critical mass at every level in the media, in the scientific community and research. You just saw probably that Bill Gates committed to donate $30 million yeah. with their group to find better ways to diagnose this disease process, which I'm super excited about. And so this is reaching a point of, of critical mass. So we want to be in a, in a situation where we can take in all this knowledge, all this advancement and be able to move it in, into clinical practice right away. And so you are absolutely right from the foundation, the clinical pieces that I obtained from the original protocol, we've been able to now add in and plug in a lot of the things that are being, um, revealed to be very, very effective in helping these patients even further. That's, I, I appreciate that you're taking it to other doctors to then take it to patients rather than just having a, like a, an ultra massive practice with one guy that's trying to keep it all together. Like There's I, no way. There's yeah, no that's, way. I appreciate it though because what, what's happening is, it, whether you know it or not, I think you probably do, but what's happening is, is you're just hitting that ripple and it's starting to expand. Uh, but I think it's pretty awesome. I think that's more like legacy stuff than than you think about right now being, you know, under 40 years old. But um, Thank you. I think it's cool. So, um, yeah, tell us ultimately, about, go ahead. Yeah, sorry to interrupt you, but ultimately what we've decided myself and, and my team is that we want to impact a billion brains. And we really noticed that one practice, there's no way that it can do that. And so, uh, we've been really fortunate to be have been approached by functional medicine doctors, successful doctors around the country uh -huh. that want to be part of this mission, that want to be part of this legacy. And so far, they're, they're, we're going to make it, man. We are going <laughs> to touch a million brains. I am certain. I love it. So before we got on air here, you were telling me about an event you're having in September. Um, what's the event? What's uh, What's going on? Awesome. So... Um, as you might suspect, um, clinical practice, writing books, doing all the stuff that I'm doing is keeping me insanely busy. But <laughs> like I just told you, um, I have a huge commitment to be able to expand this information, to be able to touch as many lives as we can through uh, other practices. And so we are just putting on two events a year. Uh, the first event passed in June, the first weekend of June. It was here in Denver at the Crawford Hotel. It was amazing. It was, I, I, I think you saw a little bit about it. And so it was a remarkable event. Uh, the feedback was amazing. And that constituted one of the very first waves of, of doctors to go out there and put this all together in their practices. We have one more event that's planned for this year. Um, it's going to be a slightly larger event. It's going to be called drive the shift and in the event we're going to have um, basically this entire niche broken down we want to be able to start teaching the foundation to doctors that are out there that are wanting to learn and and let me help you understand um, something that is kind of our belief we really think that doctors that aren't moving into this clinical niche into this approach and their functional medicine doctors their practices might become obsolete over the next 10 years. This is the niche that everybody's going to be working in the next 10 years to gain position and to gain advancement in. Uh, we're going to have internationally known speakers, functional medicine experts. We're going to have people that are experts in uh, public speaking, branding. We're going to have uh, people that are experts in in uh, how to create, you know, a webinar and a marketing piece that will really help your practice put this information out there on top of having clinical experts that are trained and certified in this protocol to be able to help doctors become highly proficient at understanding and treating this condition. So do you have a landing page or anything like that? <laughs> yeah, we do. Um, it's called, uh, it's www.driveTheshift.com forward slash for your group and for your audience who we're actually very proud and excited to be a part of uh, just hit forward slash hero and it's going to take your audience and your listeners to a unique landing page that is exclusive for your for the following of nutrition hero because we've actually done something really special uh, for your listeners 
All right, sweet. So driveTheShift.com forward slash hero, just to make sure we're all on the same page there. And um, with that, what are the dates? You said September. Yeah, it's the third weekend of September. I all right. I believe that's going to be like the 16th. I'll tell you right now. So yeah, that's the, it's going to be the 21st to the 23rd. If I'm All right. Honest. Yeah, that's what it is. 21st to the 23rd. Yep. Cool. I just have so many things going on. I just, that's all right. Is this a free event or are you? No, I'm sorry. 14, 14th through the 16th, 14th through the 16th um, is going to be September 14th through the 16th. And that's going to be here in Denver. No, the event is not a free event. Um, I'm glad early, I asked. <laughs> <laughs> the early bird price is uh, $249 for the yeah. entire event. Um, what's interesting is that we've actually spent thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on putting this all together. And uh -huh. we're trying to make it um, accessible to functional medicine doctors that are wanting to bring this into their practice. Now, after, um, after the end of July, that price will go up to 349. Okay. However, for your listeners, Brad, we have decided to um, allow them to have a reduced fee just for being loyal listeners to the Nutrition Hero podcast and for being at the forefront of the world of functional medicine, keeping themselves educated and informed. So we've actually added an additional $50 off. So if you um, utilize the promo code HERO, all small caps, that is HERO, all small caps, we are going to take another 50 bucks off your registration for that weekend. You're going to be paying $199. Hey, that's pretty nice. Thanks, man. So I like that. All right. Um, when we look at what, um, where, where we're headed overall in the functional medicine world. I just want to touch on this uh, because I share the similar opinion as you do here. Practices that are not involving a neurologic health. Um, I strongly agree with you that they're going to be, at some point, they're going to be behind the eight ball. And the reason I say that is that most of the disease processes that you see in functional medicine right now that patients are dealing with just in a, in a normal FM clinic, uh, the inflammatory issues, they're being multiplied by a patient's genetics. And the holy grail of patient health is not the heart, it's the brain. And, um, and that's, I, I agree with you. So I just wanted to comment on that because I see that as you know, the next decade of functional medicine is definitely going to be where things are headed. So, and totally fits the chiropractic paradigm from the top down. You got to start with the top down and that's really what we're looking at. So anyway, Absolutely. just wanted to throw yeah, that I in there for you. I resonate <laughs> with that a hundred percent. All right. And, and actually to piggyback off of, off of that, one of the most remarkable things that we've seen is that the doctors that are becoming uh, really successful at working with the brain, um, are actually becoming way better in all of their other niches because they are developing a much broader vision to be able to look at their diabetes, at their autoimmune, at their GI, because there's more thing, a few more things to look at when you look at the brain. And lastly, um, you've probably seen this and heard of this, but as functional medicine has been exploding over the last four or five years, uh, the doctors that are kind of staying close to diabetes and thyroid and kind of doing and working within the same niches, not, not that that's a bad thing, but these niches are now um, really saturated with mm -hmm. competition from one practice to another. And so uh, being able to become the most valuable doctor in your community, I think there's a lot to be said about that and that passion to continue to grow, expand, and learn as a functional medicine practitioner, I believe is critical in long-term success. Awesome. Doctor, I appreciate you being on the show today. All right. I just want to make sure that everybody gets the details here. It'll be in the show notes below, but it's driveTheShift.com slash hero, driveTheShift.com forward slash hero. And the event is uh, September 14th through 16th in Denver, right? 
Yep. And um, 199 with the code HERO. Otherwise, all you're going to... small caps. That's right. All small caps. So that'll be good. Ruben, thanks for being here, man. I appreciate what you doing. Thank you so much. And thank you to every single Nutrition Hero listener for being at the forefront of the healthcare revolution. Um, I hope to see a few of you in the journey to save a billion brains. Yes, sir. All right. Have a good day, man. You too. Thanks, Brett.